start with ID diff. All right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, that, that's all right. Um, so now we have basically a question of why we need uncertainty. And then the main question remains of what is uncertainty? And here we mainly focus on the task of the classification problem. And usually you have a classification problem in some high dimensional space. In the case of IID data, you usually have some intuitive expected behavior of a reliable classifier. If um, basically a model should indicate low data uncertainty and low model uncertainty. If the model is sure about its prediction, meaning the kind of features are similar to training data and you can make a very certain prediction. You expect a high data uncertainty, but low model uncertainty if the model is not exactly sure as it could be, for example, a 50-50 decision, meaning that you have some features lying between two classes, for example. And you expect the model to output high data uncertainty and model uncertainty if the model is unsure, for example, when the data point is out of distribution. And this basically then brings us to a certain prediction for IID inputs. As seen, we kind of have the principle of the predictions based solely on input features. And you have a distinction between aleatoric or data uncertainty and epistemic or model uncertainty. And as kind of having said that in this small example, if basically you can make a very clear prediction, the data is similar to training data, you have low overall uncertainty. If you have something like a 50-50 decision, you have high aleatoric uncertainty, but the model kind of is certain. So you have a low epistemic uncertainty. And lastly, um, basically, if the point is an outlier, you have uh, a high overall uncertainty and in particular high epistemic uncertainty. For ID data, there has been tons of work on basically uncertainty prediction or estimation. We have typical ensembles, we have Bayesian neural networks, we have Gaussian processes, um, we have recent approaches like PostNet um, at kind of our chair. And they kind of try to tackle this problem in different fashions. More importantly, for ID data, we have kind of a certain evaluation pipeline to actually evaluate uncertainty measures. Because if you actually want to use these metrics in real-world applications for trust and safety reasons, you need some form of basically measuring how good your uncertainty is. And typical measures are calibration, which answers the question, does the model predict reliable probabilities? Um, we have some OD detection experiments, which answers the question, does the model detect abnormal inputs? And you have something like robustness to feature shifts, which answers the question, can the model be robust against shifts or can the model at least detect input shifts? And we come kind of a bit more about those detailed experimental settings later. So, but now we have kind of data points in some space, but what if those data points are feature representations of graph nodes? And this is then the typical no classification setting in the graph domain. And this question arises, especially since the meaning of out of distribution is kind of hard to define or harder to define in the graph domain and related work on uncertainty estimation is actually rather limited. Um, for graph or node inputs, we have basically um, the case that the prediction is not solely based on input features, but also on the neighborhood. And this also like led to recent graph neural networks um, trying to enrich the information of the features of a single node by aggregating them with the features of its neighborhood. And those are kind of typical message propagation schemes or message passing schemes. And this message passing also leads to a natural distinction between um, predictions without and with network effects. So if you look solely at the node's features, you have kind of prediction without network effects. And if you additionally um, base the prediction on neighborhood aggregations, you have a prediction with network effects. And we also will use that distinction later on. Um, for uncertainty, at, like estimation, the desired behavior is also a bit unclear in this setting because we have like the interdependence of nodes, but the features themselves, for example, could be uncertain. And for no classification, you typically have model uh, like graph uh, GCNs, APPMP, um, graph attention networks, whatever. And they kind of are quite good when it comes to no classification, but they usually do not provide reliable uncertainty estimation. Over experimental evaluation of like work mostly is based on accuracy, and there is actually only few works on uncertainty. 
More importantly, the few related approaches and uncertainty estimation directly build upon message passing schemes. And then they kind of apply known uncertainty estimation techniques on the aggregated hidden representations. However, those related works then do not really consider expected characteristics uncertainty estimates should have as, for example, intuitively shown in the beginning. And to illustrate kind of the flaw of, of the advantage, disadvantage of using message passing is consider a graph. And in this graph, a few nodes are perturbed. For like citation, uh, yeah, network data sets usually have some normalized features. And it yeah, simply could be that you kind of forget to normalize a few features, for example. This kind of is a clear outlay of, of like the node features. But without the graph structure, then you could clearly indicate those kind of perturbed nodes as out of distribution. But if you have a message passing going on, basically the perturbation spreads and spreads with each message passing step. And Current approaches therefore allow only a few perturbed nodes to influence the uncertainty estimates or even the predictions of a large fractions of nodes in the graph. And this potentially could render the predictions useless. And compared to the initial intuition from the IID domain, this seems a bit counterintuitive. And this is basically where we build upon our work. And this brings us to our research contributions. And Bertra is now taking over. Oh. I'm taking over first. Uh, can we go? Sure, yeah. Can, yeah. Can you quickly go a slide back if you're still? Yeah. So um, here you're saying that usually we have data points that are um, like somewhat IID at least, and we're when we're doing our uncertainty estimates, they yeah, have no structure like this where they get problems. Because here in this case, we can have input nodes, like different input nodes that influence our prediction for one node. Is that the... I'm not, not sure if I understand the, the question correctly, but the, the idea is right. So basically, um, like in, in this setting, you have like one put up node in an extreme case. Yeah. And if you then do a two hop aggregation, basically, all those red nodes are potentially influenced by this one wrong node. Yeah, okay, but now my question is like, do you see this as a problem? Like it is hard, now harder to do uncertainty estimation than if we have IID data, or do you say this is kind of a, a good thing because we now see what, or, or we at least have a structure and know where the uncertainty comes from? Um, you kind of you could you could also argue like that but now let's assume you have like multiple sources of uncertainty right then you could have overlaps of basically neighborhoods and then it will be quite hard to actually detect the, the source of this uncertainty and we also have this discussion right because this is kind of a more conservative estimate kind of just like acknowledging the graph domain basically and saying okay i have this dependence and if one node is perturbed i potentially have a huge like neighborhood of predictions being subject to some source of uncertainty. On, on the other hand, right, if you like argue, okay, ideally in the, in the graph domain, right, I could make a prediction by kind of ignoring some of the neighbors. If I have like 10 neighbors, my prediction could be at least as certain um, if I just rely on nine nodes, right? But since aggregation is kind of a summation based aggregation, right? And you have like the extreme case where one basically feature vector goes to infinity, so to say, right? Then you can influence all of the neighbors to a very extreme degree. And kind of we're coming from the other direction that ideally uncertainty should allow to basically discard nodes in the aggregation step, right? So. If I, before, prior to aggregation, and this is what we kind of try to introduce with this with and without network effects. So discarding the graph structure, if I already know that like one feature vector is definitely out of distribution, but I could argue that, okay, I might not propagate that information any further. And then the question is, how do we come up with uncertainty estimates that account for this fact? Okay, yeah. If that makes sense. Yes, thank you very much. Then let's have the hand over to Bertrand. Great. 
So I will quickly share my screen. Oh, I have to stop. <laughs> so it should be quite smooth. Great. Um, okay. Can you see it? Yes, everything works. Great. So basically, all these motivations that uh, Maximilian uh, presented leads us to basically the three main contributions of uh, our paper. So the, the first contribution, right? Uh, yes, uh, the first, first contribution is first to, to clarify the desired behavior of uh, uncertainty estimation under these different, under different circumstances. So basically with and without network effects and also for the different types of uncertainty estimation. And so we, we do this basically by proposing three axioms in, in the paper. Um, the second contribution is to design a new model which satisfies these uh, axioms and um, then is able to, to predict like reliable uh, uncertainty estimates. And uh, the third contribution is basically to have some evaluation of uh, for uncertainty estimation in the graph domains, since as Maximilian mentioned, there is not a lot of work compared to uh, the IID setting. So let's start with the first contribution, which is basically our axiomatic approach for the uncertainty estimation for node classification. And so in this case, as I mentioned, we propose three generic axioms. Um, and basically, they make, again, this, this distinction between aleatic and epistemic uncertainty that we have seen that exists in the uh, IED domain. And also make the distinction between uncertainty without and with network effects. So, for example, we would like that the axiom states that, so intuitively, the axiom states that um, we should recover the behavior of the IED setting without graph structure, as you can see in the left. Um, and the axioms also states that um, the uncertainty uh, estimation should uh, spread across uh, neighboring nodes. So if one node is uncertain, basically, it should basically spread uh, the uncertainty through the, through the edges. So this is just some, somehow just some intuitive explanation about um, what this ax uh, axiom states. And the way we design it, design them is basically we try to make them generic so that we can use them for different applications, but also for different models using different definitions, for example, for, answer, for aleatoric on epistemic uncertainty, so that people can also use them in different, um, I don't know, circumstances or like applications. Um, so we can just go first with the first axiom. So the first axiom describes the desired behavior for aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty without network effects. And so this is the axiom. So a node's prediction without network effects should only depend on, on its own features. And a node with features more different from training features should be, assi should be assigned higher uncertainty. So let's see just one example with these two diagrams. So for example, here you see that the purple node uh, is assumed to have features more different from training data um, than the yellow node. And that's why uh, it leads to the higher aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. So on the left, you can see aleatoric uncertainty with this flat distribution for the purple nodes and more picky distribution for the yellow node. And on the right, you can see a visualization for the epistemic uncertainty with this uh, uh, spread uh, distribution on the, on the Dirichlet triangle, so to say, for the purple node, and this concentrated distribution on the Dirichlet triangle for the yellow node. Um, so yeah, this is just some visualization to represent like aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. Uh, so this is the first axiom. And then, we propose then a second axiom, and this, this one describes the desired behavior for epistemic uncertainty with network effects. And uh, what it says basically is that all else being equal, if a node predictions without network effects is more epistemically certain, then its neighbor's predictions with network effects should become, should become more epistemically certain. So again, we have another example here. We can again look um, at uh, the, the purple node um, on the left without network effect. The purple node, the, the epistemic uncertainty is quite high. Is quite high because you can see that 
the, the purple points are really spread out over the jelly clear triangle. And on the right, with network effects, uh, the uncertainty is much lower for the purple node because the, the neighboring nodes were quite confident in their predictions. And uh, you can see basically that the, the, the Purple points are more concentrate, concentrate, concentrated in the, in the on the jelly clear triangle. And okay, then we have uh, our third axiom, which describes in this case the desired behavior for aleatory uncertainty with network effects. And there is two parts for this uh, for this axiom. So the first one is all else being equal, node predictions with network effects should have higher high high. Sorry, so should have higher aleatic uncertainty if it's near both predictions without network effect have high aleatic uncertainty. And the second part is that for, um, node predictions with network effect should have higher aleatic uncertainty if it's near both predictions without network effects are more conflicting. So we have again one uh, short uh, example for this. So in this case, we can have a look, for example, at the predictions of the grid nodes. And you can see that before, without network effects on the left, the distribution of the green node is quite picky, concentrated on the second class. And on the right, basically, the distribution of the, um, of, of the green node is more flat uh, because basically uh, its neighbors um, have uh, more conflicting predictions, meaning that the red node, for example, would predict uh, the second class by the purple node would predict, I don't know, uh, uh, third or second class. Um, and also because um, the, the, the neighboring nodes are more uncertain. So basically, the, the uncertainty of the red and purple nodes uh, are spread, spread over the green nodes. So let's try to summarize briefly what uh, oh, um, these three axioms. So uh, a bit more formally. So as I mentioned, we distinguish between aleatic and epistemic uncertainty uh, without and with network effects. So we can just add some notations for this. And without network effects, we, may, we, we said that the node prediction should only depends on its own uh, node features. And also that um, features uh, a node with feature very different from training uh, data should increase uh, uncertainty uh, significantly. And with network effects, we mentioned uh, that basically the uncertainty, both aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty, should spread um, across uh, the neighboring nodes. And uh, also that more conflicting pr um, predictions for uh, neighboring nodes should lead to higher aleatoric uncertainty. Um, so this is for the axioms. I'm just stopping in case there are any questions or? Not from my side, but please to the audience, if anybody ever has any questions, also feel free to raise your hands on, yeah, or ask questions now. Yeah, there we go. Barat. Uh, yeah, hi, hi, Bertrand. So I just had a quick question here. When you said uh, this without network effects, you now you're saying that the node features, uh, the node XP, which are more different from training features, uh, they would have high epistemic uncertainty. That was not clear to me. I mean, aleatic uncertainty is clear. Yeah, that, that that's that, that seems not quite um, uh, obvious. But uh, also, if the, if the training features are different, why would it uh, no have a more higher epistemic uncertainty? Just want to know your thoughts, uh, Bertrand. Yeah, sure. So I guess the idea is that let's say um, during uh, the training phase you, we just observe like nodes um, with a certain a certain type of features. I don't know. We just observe like I don't know papers uh, from uh, one domain like machine learning uh, machine learning domain. Then we would like that at um, inference time, basically, if we meet a node with very different features. So, for example, a paper from a completely different uh, domain, I don't know, uh, uh, literature, for example, then we would expect that the, domain, uh, the, the model would, would spot that these features are very different from what it has seen during training. That's why we would like the model to be capable to, to basically predict a very high uh, epistemic uncertainty there. Does it make sense? Yeah, makes sense, uh, uh, Bertrand, thanks. Great. 
So I guess if there is no other questions, I can just continue. Um, so basically it leads to uh, our second contribution, which is basically um, we, based on these axioms, we just try to propose um, a new model called uh, graph posterior network. Um, and this model has some Bayesian uh, motivation. So I will just try with uh, a, a recall um, of uh, the Bayesian update because it's just maybe easier to understand uh, basically what does the graph posterior network. So yes, for recall for a single categorical distribution, uh, the Bayesian co update consists in just updating the alpha parameters um, of the uniform of a uniform directly prior with the observed class, class, class counts beta. So for example, if we have 10 classes, the, the class counts beta would be just a vector of size 10 with, um, I don't know, uh, five at uh, position zero. If we observed five, uh, five data, we are from class uh, five. Uh, during training. And um, in this case, basically, the, 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 the categorical distribution models the aleatoric uncertainty, while the directly uh, distribution models the epistemic uncertainty. And so this is somehow the standard Bayesian update, where you, you don't predict a different categorical distribution um, where you just have a single categorical distribution. Now for uh, classification, um, we have basically, we predict a different categorical distribution for uh, every new input that you feed into the model. And so basically you can see that the, 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 the probability vector P uh, has this index U, uh, which is uh, basically the index of the input. And in a previous work, basically, we, we proposed with post network um, uh, an, an input dependent patient update. Um, and uh, this, uh, this input dependent patient update just predict a different class pseudo counts, beta, beta, beta indexed also with u for every input, input based on its, on its features only. So basically, this, the problem of this is that. Um, so the good the good thing is that you have a different Bayesian update when you have a different input, but the problem is that it does not account for the uh, graph information uh, uh, of your data. So of of the it does not account for the neighbors of uh, a given in input, for example. So this motivates basically uh, what we call the Bayesian update for inter interdependent uh, inputs. So in this case. Um, the, the core idea is the core idea is to replace the feature the, the core idea is to replace just the the feature pseudo counts and by an aggregated class pseudo counts based on neighborhood features so here you can see that uh, the the beta vector um, is not simply called beta features but it's called beta aggregated because it will aggregate some information from the neighboring nodes to compute like the pseudo uh, pseudo counts and Therefore, the uh, uncertainty estimates. So this co this computation of this beta aggregated is really crucial, and so I will just try to explain how it works. Um, so there are three steps to compute like this uh, beta uh, uh, to compute predictions based on graph posterior network. Uh, the first step is just um, given an input node. Um, graph posterior network computes the feature pseudo counts, which accounts for uncertainty without network effects. This computation basically is performed using a, a feature encoder and normalizing flows, as you can see in the background. And this is similar to uh, the previous work um, called uh, posterior network. And also, it is guaranteed to, to, to provide high uncertainty for features different from training data. So if you look at the formula on the, on the top, basically the pseudo counts for class C is proportional to the uh, normalizing flow density of the class C. Um, and this normalizing flow density is fit on a low dimension latent space, which contains um, features which are important for the classification task. And so ba basically, um, 
if uh, there is some input node with the, with features very different from uh, what does observed during training, um, the 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 latent uh, the latent position in the latent space will be very different from from um, from what it uh, from what it, uh, the model is used to have uh, to have seen during training, and therefore the density at this position will be super low and will lead to to, to high uncertainty um, without network effects. But then, so this allows to compute like just the the, the beta vector without uh, without uh, the the neighborhood inf neighborhood information. But then, what we will do is we'll just aggregate the solar bounds from uh, from neighboring nodes to uh, to create like this beta aggregated uh, aggregated uh, vector. And this accounts for uncertainty with network effects by simply diffusing basically these feature pseudocamps. Uh, and the computation is performed using um, is performed using um, approximated approximating sorry is performed by approximating the personal page page rank scores uh, with poor poor iterations sim similarly to APPNP. And the third step is basically what we have what we have seen on the slide before. So just doing applying the the Bayesian update that we we discussed uh, before. Um, so this is basically a, a summary of the model. So the motivation with this Bayesian update for interdependent inputs and these three steps, which basically summarize how it works. Uh, I'm not sure if any of if there is also any question about that. So I just take like four seconds in case there are some questions. Okay. Oh. Four, three, two, one. Come on, people. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, thanks for the. I think you're doing a great job at explaining, and I mean the visualizations are just very helpful. Um. So if, if no one has a question, I would like to make an additional remark to Barat's question, right? So now we basically have presented our framework of using categorical and Dirichlet distributions. And the nice thing about this is basically that if you have a Dirichlet distribution, which indicates high epistemic uncertainty, you basically resort back to the uniform prior you have chosen before, or like in general, the prior you have chosen before, but which is a uniform prior, and that also means that basically each class then has the same prediction score, so to say. And this basically means that if you have high epistemic uncertainty, you directly also have high aleatoric uncertainty. We just don't care about this like aleatoric uncertainty now because we now know that like the source is basically coming from data, so to say, and that it doesn't really make sense to look at the aleatoric uncertainty. On the other hand, if we follow Batros like example, you have like two papers. One is reinforcement learning. One is planning or like typical image classification, whatever. Like there's a certain overlap in those papers. And then you might have to classify this like as 50% reinforcement learning or 50% image classification, um, depending on, on the task, whatever. And then you have high aleatoric uncertainty because you have you can't really make a certain prediction for one specific class, but kind of the input is actually a valid input point, which means that you have a low epistemic uncertainty, if that makes it any clearer. Okay. Then I think that I will just then continue with the... Uh, the next, the, the next, uh, the the next slide. So as I mentioned be before, we we try to propose like axioms, and then we propose a model. And what we try to do right now is to show that the model satisfies these axioms, which which, which sounds somehow reasonable, which describe a reasonable uh, behavior for the uncertainty estimation. And so that's why we 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 showed in the paper like uh, three theorems. Uh, to show that it satisfies it satisfies these axioms, and um, yes, basically we show in these theorems we make mild assumptions on the on the on the model um, that are probably not that interesting to to discuss right now, but these are just technical uh, assumptions. 
And what they, they show this quantity is that basically, again, we have reliable alert and epistemic uncertainty and a reliable uncertainty without and with network effects. So on the next slide, I will just try to summarize a bit like, uh, what these uh, guarantees uh, say. So first, uh, without network effects, uh, we have the following guarantee that uh, the alertic and epistemic uncertainty uh, is larger for more anomalous inputs, uh, which shows basically that we uh, GPN or graph cluster network satisfies the axiom one. So as, um, as uh, we answered also before, basically, if the input features have as a very large norm, then we have the guarantee that uh, the pseudo counts uh, or and with network effects will converge to, to zero, meaning that we will have a both a very high epistemic uncertainty and high aleatoric uncertainty, uh, aleatoric uncertainty because as Maximilian mentioned, basically we do this, um, we recover like the prior, which is supposed to contain a very high aleatoric uncertainty when we have a very low pseudo counts. And um, the second part of the guarantee is basically for the case with network effects. And in this case, um, we, um, we, we have the guarantee that, that both uncertainty types um, will be larger when neighbors are more neighbors are more allergically or epistemically uncertain or more conflicting. So if you look at uh, the, the first line, basically, uh, we see that the, the, the guarantee is basically, there is maybe some typo here, it should be not alpha, but beta. Uh, alpha features uh, and alpha aggregated should be replaced by beta features and beta aggregated. And basically, if this uh, pseudo count is, uh, uh, is decreasing, uh, basic uh, for, so if, the node u as a pseudo count which is decreasing. Basically, the neighbor, the neighbor v, uh, will uh, will have also some pseudo count will be decreasing, meaning that the uncertainty, the epistemic uncertainty of this uh, node v will also decrease. And then uh, we can have some similar um, guarantees, but for aleatoric uncertainty. And in this case, we look at a different measure for 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 aleatoric uncertainty, which is simply looking at the entropy of the of the of the uh, categorical distribution that we predict. So in this case, we say that the entropy of the categorical distribution, if the entropy of the categorical distribution of the node u is increasing, meaning that we are more uh, aleatorically uncertain, then the entropy of the neighboring node v will also increase. So somehow we have, we have this guarantee that the uncertainty really spreads from one node to its neighbors, uh, both for aleatoric and epistemically, epistemic uncertainty. And the, the, the last part of the, of the guarantee is basically that if a neighboring node U um, is, becomes more uncertain about, about the, on the winning class uh, C, C star here, Basically, we have the guarantee, meaning that uh, his, his prediction is more conflicting with the winning prediction at that time. Then the aleatorically aleatoric uncertainty for the node V will also become higher. So this is somehow a, a formal a formal way to instantiate the um, the axioms and then show that uh, graph positive network satisfies the the axiom. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions uh, on this otherwise, but I guess might be not the most interesting part for, for people, but because it's a bit technical, but um, wanted to, to, to just mention this in case. Um, see one question in the chat maybe. Yeah, so if I, can you please clarify what are the features you use in PP? PP, yeah. you use in PRR, you write, yeah, but are these at the final node representations? So I guess this is more relevant. Sorry. Yeah. This is relevant to this, right? And yep. basically, so what we diffuse, what is the quantity that we diffuse is basically this. Um, pseudocamps without network effects or these pseudocamps just based on 
uh, features only. So basically, what we can do is we can uh, compute these uh, PPR coefficients between for for each node u, each pair of nodes u and v, and then we use these coefficients to diffuse the the pseudo counts uh, based on features only and the aggregated pseudo counts. So of course, yeah. This might not be, since it might not be efficient to just compute all possible coefficients for each pair UV, we just approximate it with a personal edge page rank, um, as you, uh, as we mentioned. So basically, which was introduced in uh, one ICLR paper from uh, a colleague, Jonas. Does it make sense? Yes, to me, <laughs> I think it is. Like uh, maybe maybe not clear what the um, yeah maybe it's nice if one reads the diffusion paper or knows about the diffusion paper before. Um, but because I guess maybe it's related to one thing that is discussed in this APPNP in the NPPNP paper because maybe there is the options to either diffuse, like for example, we could have diffused like the latent representations uh, uh, F theta, like the latent representation in the low dimensional space. So basically this F theta uh, XV, basically we could diffuse this, but this actually, um, if we do this, we are not guaranteed basically where we don't have the same guarantees that we want. So, so is there no GNN message aggregation involved? So I guess the only aggregation involved is really this uh, APPNP diffusion. Yeah. But maybe, Maximilian, I, I recall that at some point we tried also like different aggregation schemes, but basically also we, if we use, for example, a GCN aggregation for the encoding, or encoding part, then we don't have this distinction between without and with network effects, which is somehow nice. And um, because after, a single message passing, basically, we, we like uh, uncertainty with and without network effect are immediately entangled, so to say. Um, I, I mean, kind of PPR based diffusion is kind of can be seen as a GNN based aggregation if you basically pre process the graph as kind of the diffusion paper Hannes was referring to, right? So so basically with the fusion, you can pre-process the graph in such a structure that you get a dense, like a denser graph where the edge weights basically correspond to the PPR scores. And then if you do a one hop aggregation, you end up kind of doing the same thing. So that's kind of yeah. two, two, two ways to see that. I mean, um, yeah, it is still, it is still a GNN aggregation, if you want to call it that. Yes. Um, kind of the, the other thing is you, you can actually do, and we tried that to, to some extent, right? So basically GPN, if you if you don't do the aggregation at the end, but you just basically take the, the feature uncertainty pseudo count, so to say, is basically you could take a vanilla GNN aggregation and reweight basically kind of the, the outgoing edges by the node uncertainty, so to say. So you, you kind of could use that, so to say, in some, some upstream task if you want to. Uh, and it kind of, sometimes it's quite interesting to see that you can actually improve um, to some extent existing GNNs by simply accounting for this uncertainty information, so to say. Uh, the advantage of our approach is that it's trained end to end, so to say. And it kind of gives this nice entangle the disentanglement of uncertainties and network effects, so to say, um, in an end to end training. Yeah. And I, I guess maybe something we can say is already with this joint training, you will see later with the uh, experimental results, but there is already some nice robustness, uh, um, I don't know, Results, um, but yeah, we'll see this uh, later, I, I think. And so we'll just then continue. So this was about basically guarantees. And 
since also uh, it's important to talk about this, uh, the limitations basically of, of our, so the first limitation that we would like to emphasize is that the uncertainty estimates that we have is task specific, meaning that um, the, the uncertainty variation or is performed really on this latent space, which contains just features which are important for the classification task. And if a feature is not important for the classification task, basically, and changes drastically, uh, the uncertainty estimates will not change. So this could be a, a down or um, like a negative or a positive side, depending on the application, because sometimes it's good to be insensitive to this, but sometimes also you would like to detect any type of a perturbation, uh, including those which are not important for the classification task. Another limitation is that here, as we mentioned in the axioms, uh, we um, rely on the fact that the graph is homo homophilic, especially in the axioms in the second and third axioms, where we, we say that uncertainty estimates of neighboring nodes should be, uh, should be similar to each other. And we do not tackle the problem of heterophilic graphs. And the last, um, last limitation is basically um, we, there is two, in the uncertainty uh, estimation literature, there are different types of OD data. There are OD data which are just uh, very different from training data. So basically, um, I don't know, extremely far from training data, so to say. And there are OD data which are closer to the in, in distribution data or the training data. For example, um, you can think um, of um, if, you, if you have papers, as uh, Maximilian uh, mentioned, basically, you can uh, think about papers about reinforcement learning and then close OD data. So you, you could have seen paper, papers about reinforcement learning during training. And then close OD data would be papers about uh, some other machine learning domain and far OD data would be papers about, um, I don't know, a completely different domain, like just some uh, article in a newspaper, for example. And basically what we say is that we have, we, we proposed in, uh, the, in our guarantees, just uh, um, we have guarantees only for far, for, from, uh, um, for far OD uh, data but we don't have guarantees for uh, close OD data. And again, in this case, it's not clear also in the literature if the, the desired behavior should be to be robust against these small shifts or simply to detect this, uh, close, uh, this close or near OD data. Um, so it's something um, that we can, uh, of course, uh, discuss. So, I think these are the three limitations uh, we mentioned in, in the papers. There might be others, and we are happy if you have any comments on this. But otherwise, if there are no questions, I will just give uh, Maximilian uh, the presenter rights so that he can present like the results of the paper. All right. Yeah, we can see the screen. Perfect. All right. So, kind of last thing now is basically the experimental evaluation. Um, I said in the introduction, kind of a lot of work on uncertainty estimation in the graph domain actually just evaluates the uncertainty measures on a limited subset of tasks, so to say. Um, and this is also one of the motivations of this work, basically to provide some. Yeah, exhaustive evaluation to some extent of existing baselines um, and like overall we chose 13 baselines vanilla models but also like um, uncertainty techniques which are applied to the graph domain in a straightforward fashion and we considered a var variety of node classification data sets with different sizes and the largest one was the archive data set from the OGPN benchmark and we consider different types of experiment. Um, basically, the goal is to evaluate how the uh, uncertainty estimates, like 
how how good the uncertainty estimates are. And a typical class, uh, typical ex experiments are um, to detect left out classes and to detect feature perturbations. So kind of simple out of the main uh, detection task, so to say. We also considered the robustness to feature and edge shifts, and we performed some qualitative evaluation to some extent. And to kind of give you a better overview of, of what we did, some uh, yeah, and kind of as a summary, we actually saw that our GPN approach outperforms baselines for uncertainty estimation while maintaining a relative competitive predictive performance across all data sets. And to illustrate like the different types of OD detection we had, the most straightforward is uh, basically a leave out class setting, which is similar to a poisoning attack. So you have an original graph. And in this case, we have illustrated the different classes in the graph with different colors. And then for training, you actually just ignore one class, but you, you keep actually the nodes in the graph. And then you have basically the ignored loads uh, nodes being the OED nodes and the kept nodes, the in distribution nodes, and you try to distinguish them based on the uncertainty metrics. Um, note that it's actually also possible to kind of also delete the edges of the left out nodes, um, and it would be similar to an evasion setting, but the poisoning setting is more challenging, which is why we chose that. And it's also quite standard in the few works and OED detection in the graph domain. And then we also consider different ways to actually evaluate the perturbation of individual node features. And this is an evasion setting basically. So we have a pre-trained model on the original graph. And what we then do is basically to perturb a few nodes and try to check the capability of the model to detect those perturbations. And uh, in the, like a straightforward fashion, so to say, you have a global attack where you basically perturb a different, a particular fraction of nodes, which means that we replace the features of a particular fraction of nodes in the graph with either random Bernoulli features or random Gaussian features. And then we have kind of the perturbed nodes and the non-perturbed nodes, and our goal is to try to distinguish them. And in another feature experiment, we consider isolated perturbations, which means we only have a look at one node at a time. And then we have the original node in the unperturbed graph and the same node being perturbed by either like a random Bernoulli noise or Gaussian noise. And we do that for a couple of nodes. And this is kind of a bit exhaustive because we feed in the same graph with just node, one node perturbed at a time. And in the end, we compare all original nodes, which are the ID nodes, to all non-perturbed nodes, which are the out-of-domain nodes. And this kind of neglects the fact that basically perturbations can spread. So this is purely about trying to find those perturbed nodes in the graph again um, without considering the effect that those perturbed nodes actually might also influence neighbors, um, which is actually done with this feature shift setting, so to say, because here the perturbations also spread. And then it's actually more challenging to distinguish the ID nodes because they are also perturbed, so to say. And in terms of experiments, um, kind of we can start by basically those isolated feature perturbations. And the first result is basically that since we now have the separation or disentanglement of uncertainty with network effects and without network effects, we can basically find the nodes that have perturbed features by using this uncertainty measure that doesn't account for the graph structure. And for the very extreme case of a Gaussian setting, we actually have almost perfect classification performance of those uh, perturbed nodes. And for like a smaller Bernoulli noise, it's a bit more challenging, but we also outperform other approaches in detecting those perturbed nodes, which is quite nice. More interestingly, though, is if you have a look at the accuracy, is that we can see that um, like those nodes are perturbed, but they can aggregate information from neighbors. And since the other approaches usually rely on some hidden aggregate uh, or like yeah, neighborhood aggregation or hidden representation that can be perturbed quite drastically if you have some perturbation in the graph. And this leads to a drastic 
drop in accuracy. On the other hand, our approach is capable of discarding useless information and relying on useful information by the uncertainty measures and actually can maintain quite a good accuracy despite those perturbations being present in the graph. So there's a question. Uh, yeah, let me maybe read it out to sure, yeah. the recording as well. Is this a fair characterization from the 10K, 10, from the 10K with respect to incorporation into general GNN methods? Sorry, yeah. First, it observes in a principled way utility in distinguishing classes features slash features as coming from more um, as coming more from network effects versus directly from the node with a specific measure for identifying these. Okay, can you already comment on that? <laughs> so it observes in a principled way utility in distinguishing classes or features as coming more from network effects versus directly from the node with a specific measure for identifying these. I'm not parsing it. But do you? <laughs> um, I'm guessing the direction of this question is aiming for, right? So technically, you, you kind of have this, this question. So, right, isn't it unfair that we have like a purely feature-based measure, so to say, and the others don't have such a measure? And the argument, I think, is basically aiming at the kind of question if it's valid to switch between those representations, right? So when to have a look at the feature-based representation and when to have a look at the, so to say, network representation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and like, first it's like, the first advantage is that basically our method comes with a native feature-based representation, right? So in a really straightforward fashion, you basically have the first sanity check of saying, okay, this node is perturbed. It might require certain, um, yeah, whatever, um, attention, so to say. And the, the other direction is, right, you then still have the basically aggregated measure. And I think it might be a bit more clearer if we have a look at the, the, the next, like experimental slides so might move the question a bit, bit to like like two or three slides further down and if we move that uh, can we maybe already say something about the second point for implementations it shows value in cast and graph tasks as a standard Bayesian update process flipping between feature versus neighbor learning um I'm also not, not too sure what the, the question is. Yeah, means. okay. Uh, but if I, I would have now asked if you could maybe first explain what the question is, if you immediately knew what sort is meant with that, because I yeah. also don't I, Yeah, that. Um, this is Leo. So yeah, okay, maybe we start with number one. I, I think yeah. what I missed with number one was, uh, so what I was trying to figure out was, um, yeah, I, I was just trying to figure out like if you want to use these insights in without um, doing the methods here, but just in a, in a standard GNN model. I think what I learned was um, I thought this was about the classes and features, but it, in your answer, what you pointed out was this is more about it seems like to be about identifying that for individual nodes in an actual concrete graph that for that particular node, do you want to focus more on network effects versus on um, uh, um, the features. So it's more about individual nodes. And that, that's what's missing. I thought it was more about the classes of features. Um, for the second question, um, I guess what I, was, what I was trying to figure out here was what does it mean for, um, so historic, generally we're doing label prop in, in, in GNS, right? Like we're, we're kind of using that as a method. And then what was kind of interesting here is that it seems like you're doing more of a, like a, a classic, like Bayes, like, you know, iterative Bayesian update process, right? Um, and I, I guess what I was trying to figure out as part of that is um, you, uh, there are different ways of implementing that. And then, you know, somebody, and then there might be questions of like, for example, the efficiency of saying, hey, should, how should we implement this? Is we, should we implement this as like a, like a traditional, you know, iterative Bayesian method? Or should we try to figure out how to, you know, reverse, 
figure out how to do in a classical GNN model with label prop, with all the you know modern optimizations and kind of somehow put it back into that. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious more just from an engineering perspective, if, if there's kind of any takeaways here. Um, so I think we rather had a look at the second perspective. Um, I mean, you kind of said label prop has definitely some history in, in GNNs. Um, and like, a straightforward extension to label proc is something like belief propagation, which actually tries to do something similar, but instead of just propagating labels, you propagate some directly beliefs, and then you have like actually quite similar updates. So that also was some inspiration of this work. Um, label prop and belief propagation kind of just have the drawback that they don't work really on features. They just propagate, so to say, you know, class information or label information. And this is basically then trying to incorporate those ideas in a in a chin and framework. I'd say um, it wasn't meant to be an extension to like its rate of Bayesian methods. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay, then I guess we move on for now. Uh, so that's kind of the, the isolated perturbation. So it's kind of first takeaway is basically that the model can um, detect basically isolated node, per, or node feature perturbations still maintains quite a high accuracy on those and also has some like aggregated uncertainty estimate, which is quite high because which kind of matches then the other things which come later. Uh, the second thing is if we have a look at belief our class experiments, we can see that now basically the aggregated uncertainty measure or the uncertainty with network effects actually is the one that gives us the best result, which also makes sense because if you leave out classes in like a classification problem in a graph domain, right, the kind of the left out classes could be similar feature wise. If you have a look at machine learning papers and you leave out reinforcement learning, for example, like the, the abstracts, if you have a look at classical citation networks, the abstracts kind of could be quite similar. And we actually see that that you have some capability in just looking at the features, but um, kind of the, the main point here is that now the uncertainty with that effects kicks in, and then that we can detect those clusters of kind of forgotten or left out classes by, by looking at the uncertainty or the, the uncertainty with network effects. And this is also kind of in our axiomatic approach, kind of a desired property. And the, the next thing is, and this quite hopefully makes some things clearer, is the shift experiments. And here you basically consider the graph with the different fractions of perturbed nodes. So it's kind of a global perturbation. You vary the fraction of nodes that are perturbed and each node perturbed is kind of getting random features assigned. And the graph shown is for Gaussian perturbations, which are quite extreme perturbations. And the extreme case here is that even if like 80% of the nodes are perturbed, um, we kind of have a 60% improvement over competing baselines in terms of accuracy. And this shows the capability of the GPN approach that basically by like declaring nodes as uncertain if their features are weird, um, it basically prohibits the information of those weird nodes to spread throughout the graph and just relies on basically the certain nodes in the graph. And this is kind of actually similar to ideas from label prop. And then you actually can see that if you discard all those weird nodes, so to say, you can leverage the network structure to quite some extent and to actually have quite a good accuracy despite some heavily perturbed graphs, so to say. The other thing is like, uh, the model overall remains quite calibrated. So in this figure, we show the expected calibration error and for kind of varying fraction of nodes, we maintain basically the original uh, calibration. And the last thing is basically, if we look at how the overall, the final epistemic confidence, um, that's usually a bit confusing. If you read uncertainty papers, it often switches between confidence and uncertainty, usually just kind of the reverse thing. So epistemic confidence is the reverse epistemic uncertainty. So epistemic confidence is high if the uncertainty is low. And what we here have is basically um, by taking, so to say, the yeah, epistemic confidence 
in the unperturbed case at, in relation to the epistemic uncertainty to the perturbed case. And what we can see is basically that if we increase the fraction of perturbed nodes, the average confidence, so to say, decreases almost linearly with the degree of perturbation. And this kind of also makes some intuitive sense, right? So if you like ignore 50% of the nodes in the graph, you're 50% as confident, so to say. Our model still kind of can maintain quite a high accuracy, but it's nicely calibrated still to some quite extent um, referring to the aleatoric uncertainty, but in terms of epistemic uncertainty, we actually can extract some information basically about how much information has been discarded in this process. And this kind of probably summarizes the model quite good to some extent that you have this idea of using those feature uncertainty first. You basically then, uh, by using pseudo counts, just propagate certain information implicitly. And this leads to high accuracy in like perturbed settings and like a nice yeah, alignment of the uncertainty measure with the degree of perturbation, so to say. And it can also be seen in some qualitative evaluations. Um, this is then an evaluation of just the feature-based uncertainties from the Quorum L data set. Quorum L data set is a citation network data set in the machine learning domain. And the node features are basically just a bag of word representations of the abstracts. And on the left, you can see a typical abstract that you expect from a research paper, which is kind of written in a sophisticated fashion. It has a proper length. Um, it actually is a bit shortened here. And that's quite nice. And this actually also gets assigned a high certainty or like a low uncertainty. And on the right, you see a few examples of abstracts that get assigned a low uncertainty because uh, low certainty, but high uncertainty. Uh, because sometimes those abstracts are basically just working titles or like whatever. Um, yeah, kind of probably reminders of, of some weird uh, pre-processing stuff, whatever. And this kind of shows in a qualitative fashion that our model can sort those things out. And that's, I think, also quite a nice finding. And if you have a question, we can kind of go back to the experimental results uh, later. But then kind of to wrap things up, uh, we've shown that kind of our work introduced three axioms which specify the desired uncertainty for no classification. We propose graph plus two network, which provably, uh, provably predicts a reliable uncertainty and we also showed in an extensive experimental evaluation that the obtained uncertainty measures are quite well suited for the task of no classification. And yeah, that was the presentation of our paper. So thank you for your attention. And if you now have any remaining questions, feel free to ask them. Yeah, and that was the presentation of a very fantastic paper and a very fantastic presentation itself. Um, then, okay, uh, maybe a bit of an off topic question. Um, could I just ask what the theme program used to make slides slash diagrams are? Yeah, and I mean, with good reason for that question. I think we all like this, this style a lot and yeah, it's awesome slides. What did you use? So, uh, I guess simply to make the slides, it's simply PowerPoints, right? And actually, it turns out to be super powerful to make also some diagrams. I'm not sure about the diagram, Maximilian. Maybe you recall the diagram for the model. I'm not sure what we used there. Um, I mean, kind of some diagrams are kind of from the paper a bit modified from the paper. Those have been created uh, with ticks. So kind of uh, LaTeX figures, so to say. Um, so like there are a few LaTeX figures in there, but surprisingly you can do a lot in, in PowerPoint. And like if most of the graphics I think are actually PowerPoint representations. The, the model diagram is, is in LaTeX and like the Dirichlet triangles and that stuff is basically, um, well, actually it was not LaTeX, but that was basically just an export from a Python script that generated those, kind of was a mix of, 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 of different things, but yeah. 
Okay, but then, they are very impressive, likewise, I can only agree with um, the chat here, but um, maybe as a, as a last question from my side, what is next? Do you, do you have any future ideas for this direction? So I guess maybe I can try to comment first on this is so just on for this specific work, I guess we mentioned at some point the limitations uh, of this model. So of course, the next thing to do would be simply to tackle these limitations, look at what is the behavior for heterophilic graphs, what, what is the behavior for near OD. Um, and oh, sorry, what is the behavior for the first for, one? For, uh, for near OD data, for, for OD data, which is not far from training data, but close to training data, try, trying to have just some guarantees there. Yeah, but before that, you said something else, right? So I guess the third thing I mentioned is simply looked at heterophilic graphs. So ah, heterophilic. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. French pronunciation of it. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow. And um, yeah, so I guess this might be future direction. And I don't know if you just go at the next slide, Maximilian. There are already some other directions just regarding uh, uncertainty estimations. And for example, we just try to extend this just not to classification task, but also to, to regression tasks. Yeah. So with this uh, recent work uh, accepted at ICLR, I guess, and just related to, uh, to robustness or related to, to other type of models like energy-based models. Okay, then we have another question. Could this be used for edges, like for some edge prediction task or link prediction? Um, I mean that's that's actually something that's something I forgot. So the, the paper uses some some edge information to some extent. So we also considered edge perturbations. So what we did basically um, basically some some dice attack or some random attack where you create random edges and delete random edges. And in our axiomatic framework, we would expect that the aleatoric uncertainty increases, right? Because then you connect clusters of different classes, and this introduces the aleatoric uncertainty, but shouldn't change the epistemic uncertainty. And this is basically valid in our axiomatic approach and is also observed experimentally. Um, it might actually be a bit harder to, to like, for at least for no classification, handle edge uncertainty because classification or like, typical graphs in no classification are kind of not complete. So it's kind of hard to kind of argue about uncertainty there, right? If you technically, if you, if you add a valid edge, it could gain you more uncertain, like more information, but it might not be necessary and you can have the same amount of information in there. Um, okay. Edge prediction is something we haven't looked at. But then do you, yeah, uh, do you want to say something more about edge prediction or? Um, I, I mean, it, it kind of basically, right, if you like have a look at the probably most simple form of, of edge prediction is you, you take a dot product of hidden representation, so to say, and then you, you score them uh, to, to some extent. This kind of assumes that the node features are valid, right? Um, so this is kind of a the dependence problem, so to say. And basically our approach could introduce some um, conditional logic, so to say, that you have some information about how valid the, the node actually is, and then use this information for basically valuing how certain the edge is. But that's something one could look at, um, which might be, definitely a lot to look at because it's it's not too too straightforward actually to think about this um but yeah it's it's actually a good point yeah okay well, then let's maybe get to namit's question and then maybe Imerov, if you want to speak up to ask your question yourself that would be awesome but <laughs> in in some of recent work on yeah okay so he's asking about Uh, iterative loops where we refine the uncertainty. Um, are you familiar with these kind of kinds of methods and what do you think about them in context to graph postnet? So maybe I'm not sure what 
uh, what is um, mean, meant by iterative loops. Uh, so I'm not sure if there is a possibility yeah, to clarify this. But then let's just maybe um, if May Namit can cl uh, clarify in the chat and maybe in Mayorov in the meantime, you want to ask your question um, by what? Yeah, so I'm Thanks. just kind of curious for existing um, GNN model implementations um, that if we want to incorporate kind of like the core insights of, of this work, um, if you have thoughts on kind of like a lightweight or generic way to do that, just to benefit from the concerned identifications you're describing. Like imagine we want, we have like a PyTorch model or something and then we just, that already exists and we just want to have throw this in. So maybe um, we can just show again the model diagram for this. Um, so I guess, one way to just mix like, okay, one way to simply mix somehow the, what this model does with uh, other GNNs would be to replace somehow the, the, the part which is one and two, so to say, to just replace this part with another GNN, which directly predicts like some latent position uh, Z and then fit the density estimation on this uh, latent space. And then based on this, you can again compute like the feature pseudo comes similarly to the formula on the top, uh, these beta, uh, beta features. And this allow, would allow, allow you to be basically benefit from this um, Bayesian update or this input dependent Bayesian update also for other GNN's architecture. Um, I would say the downside is basically you might not have in this case the distinction between without uh, and with um, a network effects. So, you don't have the, the ground keys basically also for, for those uncertainty estimates. Um, like, yeah, a further extension we actually briefly had a look at is if we, you, like, if you would convert those feature pseudo counts beta into something like pseudo probability between one and zero, you could see those as binary weights, so to say, right? So if you, if you consider binary adjacency metrics, what you could do is um, the chain and aggregation kind of is some form of weighted average, right? It's basically a scale free weighted average. Um, and what you could do is introduce like an additional weight in this aggregation, which weight the kind of each node by its feature certainty, whatever. And if you, for example, convert it into a binary weight between one and zero, you have like one if it's very certain and you have zero if it's totally uncertain. And if you would do such a re-weighting, you actually could show that this re-weighting would correspond to introducing additional edge weights, which weights outgoing edges by this node weight, so to say. And it is possible to some extent to use ex to reuse existing GNNs and simply modify the adjacency metrics with those, um, so to say, modified edge weights to some extent, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and I was thinking actually already things like RGCNs or something like that about somewhere around that step of in yeah. somehow incorporating those. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And kind of the same idea, yeah. <laughs> um, Maybe to go back to Namit question. Yeah, and we have a clarif clarification in the chat. Sorry, the mic isn't working, unfortunately. I was thinking in the sense of SNPE, which uses neural nets with a distance measure to iteratively calculate uncertainty. Are you aware of that? Okay, so I'm not sure if this is NNP or SNGP pro probably, because there is one work indeed, SNGP, which was, I think I married two years ago, um, basically where they try to have this distance awareness um, and basically based on the, so basically they try to create a latent space where um, two features which are far, far in the input space should also be far in the latent space. And based on this, they create somehow uncertainty based on this. So if to, to if 
one input is far from a training input, basically you will have very high uncertainty estimates. Um, so not sure if there are really some iterative uh, loops or approach there. Um, so basically it could be also something we could use like this head of the SMGP to estimate uncertainty. So in this case, we would simply remove completely the input dependent patient updates from our model, but instead use this Gaussian process uh, based model for uncertainty. Um, yeah, I, I guess it would probably, probably work. I don't see any reasons why it should not work. Um, the, the, the downside is, of, is probably that you, you lose somehow this uh, uh, Bayesian uh, theory behind it of uh, having a proper update of your beliefs. And maybe just to mention another work, maybe also related to, to what your question was, there are also some other type of models which do multiple forward paths to have uncertainty estimation. And it might be related to what you define as iterative loops. Um, so I guess in our case, it's we do not gain anything by running multiple for our paths. So uh, this is also some good thing for, for, for the model because it's faster. You don't require multiple, multiple uh, runs of your models to get the uncertainty estimates. Um, I, get, I hope it answers the question. If it makes it not uh, more clear, I'm, free, I'm happy to, to clarify. All right, like I, um, I have no idea what this is about, but the <laughs> Nami is saying yes, that is very helpful. I might follow up with an email with references. Nice, then maybe you'll get some emails. Okay, then I've already said my uh, my last questions, and do you maybe have some last words, Maximilian Petra? Um, I guess from my side, nothing specific about the, the paper, but I just wanted also to thank you for the invitation because it's a very, ni very nice uh, uh, reading group that you have there. So very cool. Thanks a lot. All right. Then thank you for the nice presentation and the, the awesome answers. Like I, I know this, the, these topics, yeah, likewise, in my, in my year of uh, staying wonderful talk, it's absolutely true. But uh, I, I know these topics are somewhat, um, or not everybody likes to get into something like uncertainty estimation. And I guess for, for many people in the GNN reading group, this is also a completely new, new area. So I'm very, grateful for uh, for how nice of an introduction you gave yeah thanks thanks Thank you. then let's call the day and i hope to maybe see you in some smaller reading groups it would be awesome and have a nice evening yeah thank you bye thank you you too bye